All right. Well, thank you so much for having me uh, here today. Uh, today, we're going to talk about some tax strategies for traders. Um, and this is an updated uh, presentation. So there is some new stuff in here. Uh, by way of introduction, my name is Jerry Allison. I've got a, I'm a CPA uh, that works with traders accounting. And I'm also got a doctorate in business administration. So um, I, I'm, I come at this stuff from a lot of different angles to try to help traders. And what was interesting, uh, I saw part of the, the previous presentation and she was talking about fear. And uh, and I'm not gonna talk about fear as far as trading, but people fear the IRS. You, you fear taxes and you fear uh, having going to jail or you fear having your money confiscated, things like that. And what we wanna talk about today are some strategies <clears throat> to alleviate that fear. Uh, really the idea here is you need to set a tax strategy just like you do a trading strategy. And once that strategy is set, then you shouldn't have to worry about it anymore. And you shouldn't have to worry about fearing the IRS. You shouldn't have to worry about um, <clears throat> problems with your tax return. So we want to get these strategies in place so that you can concentrate on trading. Now, before we get into the presentation, I got to make the lawyers happy. So we're going to do a disclaimer here. And to the best of our knowledge, the information given here is accurate as of the presentation date. Tax changes do happen constantly. Uh, the IRS has certain discretion to change things. I don't see anything coming down the pike from Congress as far as big changes uh, for a while, but the IRS can change little things and how it's reported. And so we do wanna keep up on that. And so it could change how this is being done. Additionally, the IRS changes how it audits um, people. Uh, so one thing that's come out in the last couple of weeks is they wanna crack down on uh, people who are trading cryptocurrency. Now that may not apply to you, uh, but when the IRS comes down in one area, they also have a tendency to come down and audit other areas as well. So I just kind of be aware of maybe potential changes in auditing by the IRS in any type of trading. Uh, secondly, this presentation does not establish a professional or confidential relationship between you, me, or traders accounting. And traders accounting is not a law firm and the information provided here should not be construed as legal advice. So before you implement anything we talk about here, some of this may sound really good to you. It is a great idea to get some advice uh, from somebody that's current. And we can offer that advice, but there are other people out there as well. I do wanna mention our contact information here. Um, now the contact information, <clears throat> Uh, that has a website there, a link uh, to um, our, our website. But what that is, is that is actually a, an ebook, a free ebook that you can get. Um, and uh, you can uh, download that. It talks about many of the strategies that we are going to be talking about today. Um, it talks about <clears throat> uh, some what you can do, uh, benefits of certain uh, entities and other uh, different things that we're gonna be looking at, some of which today. Our phone number is also there, 800-938-9513. Uh, Certainly you can give us a call, you can make an appointment with us. And I'll talk about our services towards the end of uh, this presentation. And also there is a, uh, a uh, email address, it's learn at tradersaccounting.com. Uh, and I'm trying to get uh, that uh, uh, link into uh, the chat area here real quick so that we can, you guys can have that without having to type it all in. And I'm not having much success at getting all that over. So uh, let me bounce out and go to the chat. Here we go. There it is. Okay, so that link is now in the chat area. And uh, you guys can just click on that and go to uh, and get the ebook. All right, let's talk about an area that you may not think about very much. Um, we're talking about some basic information and you may not think about trading as a business. However, when you read through the IRS regulations, particularly publication 550, which if you wanna to go to the IRS website and download that, uh, it's publication 550, 
Uh, you can download that from the IRS website and read through it. It deals with all kinds of investing. But if you're going to be serious about trading and you want to deduct expenses and you want to be able to, to minimize your tax load, then you have to treat trading like a business, unfortunately. So right here, we're going to start with a business 101 session, if you will, if you're really serious about uh, trading. So the first thing in any business is you have to be concerned about cash flow. Now, many of you already are. You're, you're taking these, uh, you're, you're going to this seminar, you are taking classes, you are getting um, help in, in getting in, in making profits from trading. And that's good. That's one side and only one side of cash flow. The other side is keeping your cash from leaving you. Um, you guys have been interested in getting cash in. That's great. Necessary. It's very necessary. But you also have to be concerned about it going out. Um, and one way it goes out, obviously, is taxes. And so we want to minimize those. We also want to minimize certain things uh, that happen to protect that cash flow. Now, another point here about taking trading seriously and treating it like a business is you need to make decisions for your business or your trading based on your business's needs. Don't make them on the tax code. And this gets back to what I was mentioning in the opening slide. It goes back to fear. People who fear the tax code are always wanting to do things to minimize their taxes. And not that that's wrong, but the financial decisions are messed up usually as a result of that. Uh, one example that I can think of is I had was doing some accounting work for an auto mechanic here uh, several, many years ago, actually. And we were coming to the end of the year and he wanted to save on taxes and he was going to go out and buy a $20,000 tire machine. So he could save about $6,000 on taxes. And that decision right there, I asked him, I said, why are you getting that? How much are you going to use that in your business? He said, I'm hardly ever going to use it, but I want to get the, 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 the refund from the IRS. And I said, you're going to spend $20,000 for a machine that's going to sit there and to get $6,000 back. And it really it wasn't a good idea because he was reacting to the tax code instead of making decisions that were good for his business. So as a trader, if you, can, if you take this seriously, you need to make decisions that are based upon your business needs. Buy stuff that you need for your business, whether it's a new computer or whatever, and we can write it off. But don't go around making decisions just to save taxes. It's going to get you in trouble in the long run. Okay, well, this presentation is basically to help you be aware of all your tax and protection options. And that's part of business as well, making sure that you understand what's going on and that you can in, in, utilize what you can to, to minimize your tax and protect your assets, your trading assets, which can be quite substantial. So in this, in this presentation, we're going to cover several different topics. The first one is trader tax status. Uh, now, this is something that is, it, you could read about it in publication 550, which I mentioned. It applies to all traders, and we'll talk about it in a little bit. This is a great way to help save some money in taxes. Then we're also going to turn to entities. Entities can help you save some money. It doesn't change your tax brackets, but it does open up some things and does help you save some money. And so we'll be talking about LLCs and corporations, things like that. And then finally, for stock and options traders only, we'll be talking about the mark to market election, which can actually minimize your taxes by restructuring how the gains and losses work in your portfolio. And so we'll get to that here as we go along. But first of all, let's go to our first topic. We're gonna talk about trader tax status. Now, trader tax status is a choice. It is not something you have to clear with the IRS. It's something that actually you do if you choose to do it. However, you have to meet certain criteria. Now, trader tax status 
is for any investor. It doesn't matter whether you're trading Forex or futures or cryptocurrency or stocks or options. It, it works for anybody. But and it allows you to actually trade or deduct your trading expenses uh, on the tax return. So we're talking you can you can deduct your margin interest straight off. You can deduct uh, your data feeds. You can deduct your education and training expenses. Uh, uh, other things that are going on as, as long as they're related to trading, you can deduct those. And obviously, by deducting those, you can incur more of a refund. Uh, and get money back from the IRS. So that's obviously tax savings, a tax saving strategy here. But you have to meet the criteria. Now, if you read through publication 550, they give some very vague criteria. Um, basically, it says you have to treat this like a business and you've got to be relying on it for some or all of your income, things like that. It's vague. You might as well throw it out the window. So we've had to go to court cases uh, to find some criteria for using trader tax status. And the court cases have actually basically three criteria, three major criteria that need to be met. All three of these need to be met. So first of all, you should be making 720 trades or more per year. Uh, so for some people, that's a lot of trades. For some people, they get that done in a couple of weeks. So, but that is the criteria that's come out of court cases. What happens if you only make 700? We don't know. It's a gray area. But this is a level at which the court, the court has said that you meet uh, uh, trader tax status requirements. Second requirement is there's trading in over 75% of the trading days per year. So in other words, there's usually about 250 trading days per year. So 75% is 188 days uh, you need to trade during the year. Now, the reason for this, this gets to that business aspect that you're actually doing it most of the year. You can take some time off, but you're not going to take huge amounts of time off from trading. You're going to be treating it like a business, like any other business, whether it's a restaurant, an auto mechanic, or any other business, you're going to put yourself into it. Now, the, these first two, by the way, you say, how would they prove that? Well, these first two can be proven by your monthly statements, uh, your trading statements. You can just hand them the statements, the 1099B at the end of the year, and hand it to the IRS and say, here, count them up and you know there's 720 trades you're good on that point and they can figure the days we were trading that's not a problem either this last one though you have to actually do some documentation on the, the last criteria is there needs to be over 500 hours of trading research and education well trading we understand that research okay we can understand that that's looking at your charts and things like that Education also counts. The, the time that you're spending in this conference actually can be considered education. If you go watch a video on YouTube, it's education. Go back and listen to this broadcast or whatever, that's education. Now, how you prove that is you keep a log. Now, a lot of people ask me, well, what kind of log do you want? Is there a formal thing? There's nothing formal. Some people like to just on their day, on daily basis, put something in a spreadsheet and they just list it and what they're doing, the time, et cetera. Some people like to use a paper log and write down time and what they did. It, it's nothing formal. You just need to be able to show that you took the effort of keeping a log and that you can come up with 500 hours a year. So all three of these need to be met and you're safe. Um, <clears throat> Uh, as far as trader tax status, and you can deduct uh, the expenses on your tax return. Now, the tax savings here depend upon your current tax bracket. So if you're in the 37% tax bracket, every dollar you put on there is going to save you 37 cents. If you're in the 20% tax bracket, you're only going to save 20 cents on the dollar. But nevertheless, something is better than nothing. So it will depend upon whatever tax bracket uh, you end up in. Now, there are problems with this. And by the way, this applies not only to individuals, it also applies to entities. Uh, 
So you can do this on your personal tax return if you are an individual investor. You can do this in an entity such as an LLC or uh, an S corporation or something like that. However, there is a warning here. I need to let you know about this. A person who deducts trading expenses on their personal tax return must use a Schedule C. Now, the Schedule C is a small business return, basically. It's just a you know, a couple pages, and it goes to, with your personal 10, 1040 return. But it's the Schedule C that itself is the problem, not because you're a trader or anything like that, but because people have abused Schedule Cs for decades. They've tried to write off hobby expenses. They've tried to write off all kinds of stuff that they shouldn't. And this is what gets back to that business concept in publication 550 and what I've been talking about. The IRS wants you to treat this like a business so that you can use the Schedule C to deduct the expenses. However, the following issues do show up. One, simply by putting a Schedule C on your tax return, your personal tax return, your audit risk is increased. <clears throat> As I mentioned, these have been abused for decades. And so the IRS is automatically on the alert for them. So you increase, uh, matter of fact, every audit that I've ever been involved in has always involved a Schedule C somewhere. So uh, your, your audit risk is in, increased. Number two, there is no home office deduction. Now, if you read out there, you can say, it will tell you that Schedule C, you could take the home office deduction and you may read some other literatures, literature about that. However, and I encourage you to do this, take the Schedule C and at the bottom of the first page, there's a special place for home office deduction and there's a special form. And if you follow that form through, then you'll find out that you cannot take that home office deduction if you have a loss on the Schedule C. Well, traders are unique because that's all they report on Schedule C. They only report expenses on the Schedule C because your income goes on another form. So all you've got on the Schedule C are expenses. And so these expenses show a net loss. And therefore, because you have a net loss, you never get to take the home office deduction. Um, and if, the, if you've been taking it and the IRS comes back and finds it, they will uh, disallow that. So uh, that is something you have to walk, watch out for. Now, Keep this in mind because I'm going to come back to this here in a little bit. Number three, there may not be no asset protection. If you're just investing as an individual, <clears throat> you technically don't have any asset protection. So if you um, got into an accident, let's say you're driving, it was your fault, and the insurance doesn't cover everything, then somebody suing you could get into your trading assets as well. And finally, it's difficult to justify having a W-2 job and being an active trader. For whatever reason, the IRS does not like, they get really kind of irritated at somebody who has a W-2 job and claims to be a full-time trader on their personal return. It clashes. So that kind of increases your audit risk a little bit as well. So just kind of be aware of these things. Trading as an individual and deducting those expenses on a Schedule C can be problematic for uh, <clears throat> individuals. So we're going to talk about remedies for that here in a little bit, but I want you to just understand that if you trade as an individual and you deduct your expenses as an individual, then you raise the risk of, of problems with the IRS. So that's trader tax status. Trader tax status, if you meet the criteria, allows you to deduct your trading expenses. Now let's move on to entities. And this is actually a cure for some of that. Now there's several different types of entities, sole proprietorships, single member LLCs, general partnerships, limited partnerships, multi-member LLCs, S corporations, LLC S corporation, C corporations, and LLC, corp S LLC, LLC C corporations. That's a lot of stuff there. And we're going to boil it down to stuff that traders do not want to do. Uh, we'll eliminate some things. And first of all, we're going to eliminate the sole proprietorship and the single member LLC. They do not do anything for a trader. Uh, 
Now, the sole proprietorship is what we were just talking about a little bit ago, trading as an individual and deducting expenses on your Schedule C. Setting up a single member LLC does exactly the same thing. It looks like you're trading as an individual. You're, you're putting your expenses on a Schedule C again. It just may give you some asset protection. That's it. So uh, we do not recommend a single member LLC for anybody with one exception, and I'll mention that here in a little bit. <clears throat> the type of entity that's right for you depends upon your situation. Now, one of the things that we recommend, we, we talk to clients all the time. Matter of fact, my job is a lot of consulting as well as preparing tax returns. And I talk to people to find out what their situation is. Some people, I recommend a multi-member LLC, and I'm specifically going to talk about that here in a second. Other people, I recommend, matter of fact, I talked to somebody yesterday who I recommend you go straight to the S-Corp um, and just start doing what you need to do there. It depends upon your situation, what your needs are, and how things are going. So you need to sit down with somebody and talk about where you're going, and possibly even if, I mean, if you talk to me, we're going to lay out a plan, not just for now, but, you know, a few years down the road and what the triggers are and when you should be doing. Now, what's nice about LLCs, and some of you may not realize this, with an LLC, you get to choose how you're going to be taxed. So a single member LLC like I said, if you go to a default taxation, that just puts it right back on your return, as we were talking about. But within form, if you do it within 75 days of forming the LLC, you can choose, and you have to file an election with the IRS, you can choose to be taxed as an S-corporation. And that's what we were talking about yesterday with uh, the individual I was talking with. Um, <clears throat> With a multi-member LLC, which is a partnership that defaults to a partnership, you can choose later to be treated as an S corporation or C corporation. And by the way, you can also change later on. Um, let's suppose you have a single member that chooses to be treated as an S corporation. Five years down the road, you can choose to be treated as a C corporation. And then a few years later, you can choose to go back to a single member LLC as you want. LLCs are fantastic because it gives you the flexibility to change how you're being taxed according to the IRS tax code. So if the tax code changes unfavorably for one entity, you can change to another. And so we recommend LLCs wholeheartedly so that you have that flexibility. So that's kind of an overview of what ent entities are. Let's look at the multi-member LLC for a little bit. Multi-member LLC is basically a partnership LLC. And if you're married, you've got your partner right there. That spouse does not have to do any trading. You just need a placeholder. If you don't have a spouse, you can use another family member. They can take 1% and you have 99%. That 1% does not affect their tax return very much unless you're making scads of money. Um, <clears throat> the... You can also use as a second partner a family trust, an irrevocable trust where on paper, 1% of the profits go into the trust. You're saving up for some family beneficiary. And then when something happens to you, then that money actually gets paid into the trust and then goes to the beneficiary. But during your life, it's, it's all on paper. You never have to put the money into the trust. Um, there's other ways to do it. Even if you're you're totally alone and have nobody that you can rely on or don't want to set up a trust, we can still do it. There's other ways to do it. So we can talk to you about that. But multi-member LLCs are great. But let me give you the cons here before we go. You do have a yearly multi-member LLC in most states. There are a couple states that do not have the fee once it's in those states. Once it's set up, you never have to pay again. You just have to file your paperwork. Um, a lot of states, it's usually $100 to $200. Some, Maryland, I think, is $300. California is $800, which is highest among everybody. But you do have a yearly um, LLC fee, and that occurs with single-member LLCs as well. You will have a tax prep fee because now we're talking a partnership return. Now, one of the reasons for doing this, though, 
is getting it off your personal return. Remember, we don't want the expenses on the Schedule C of your personal return. So this gets everything off your personal return onto a separate return that looks like a legitimate business, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So you do have a tax prep fee and you do have some increased broker fees as well. You would have to set up brand new uh, trading accounts underneath the LLC's number from the IRS and trade under that number. But you also, those are business accounts then, so the, the brokerages are going to take a little more advantage of it in those cases. Now, there's a couple of workarounds about that. We will get into that now, but <clears throat> those are the disadvantages. There are some increased costs. Now, hang on to that for a minute. Here are the pros. First of all, you get the asset protection. LLC protects your assets. <clears throat> so if something outside of the LLC happens, uh, generally speaking, and it depends on what state you're in, uh, there is some protection for your trading assets. Number two, I already mentioned this, a choice in taxation methods. Um, you can choose how you want to be taxed. Generally, for most of our clients, we default to a partnership. Now, and then once they get things stabilized, we can always change over and elect to be treated as an S corporation or a C corporation or however, depending upon what needs and criteria are. So that's there's flexibility there in taxation. Number three, this is a big one, the reduction in the IRS scrutiny. Now it looks like you, when you've set up this multi-member LLC partnership, it looks like a legitimate business now instead of trying to deduct those expenses on the Schedule C, they now go on a partnership tax return, a Form 1065. And that actually opens up a couple more expenses, it's things that are deductible for you. Uh, so <clears throat> that, that can be a big help. This is a big one. And I wanted you to remember this from earlier. Remember on the Schedule C, if you deduct your expenses, you technically really cannot take the home office deduction with a multi-member LLC, and for that matter, an S corporation, you can. And so in effort, we advise our clients to do that. So what would happen is we basically take a percentage of the square footage of your office, square footage of your living space, whether it's apartment or house, that gives us a percentage. And then we can write off a percentage of mortgage interest, property taxes, rent, insurance, utilities, including cell phone and internet, um, repairs and maintenance, lawn care, HOA dues. I mean, there's a whole bunch of things. Anything that goes into living, we can take a percentage of that. And that, you know, can be as much as, as little as 1200 usually about 1200 bucks is the smallest I've seen. And we can go higher than that, usually in most, for most people. <clears throat> so it can be a quite a, a big uh, tax deduction for people. Uh, number five, it solves the W-2 trading issue. Um, I mentioned a little bit ago that if you have a W-2 and you claim to be a full-time trader on your personal return, then there's a conflict with the IRS. This gets the trading into a partnership. And so it just looks like you're investing into this business. And then you don't have to worry about that conflict anymore. And by the way, this is a pass-through entity. So all the profit... Uh, and expenses from this business still go back to your personal return, but they go through on the Schedule E. They never touch that Schedule C anywhere. And so it really cleans up your return. So that's a problem. Now, this number six here is something I need to talk about a little bit. It solves the mark-to-market, long-term, short-term dilemma. Now, <clears throat> we'll get into the mark-to-market election later. But under mark to market, you do not want to put long term assets, in other words, things that are held more than a year with short term assets because of the valuation methods. So what's creating a multi member LLC or an S corporation for that matter does it allows you to keep the long term assets on your personal side in a personal trading account. And then on the on the through the LLC, then we've got the short term day trading or swing trading, whatever it is, we keep that over there and the two never come together because what happens if you have the long-term stuff and the short-term stuff together, 
then the IRS is want, going to want, uh, under mark to market, then the IRS is going to want to value that long-term stuff under mark to market, and you'll end up paying more in taxes. We'll, we'll get to why here in a little bit. Now, number seven, and my last point here, why do a multi-member LLC? The tax savings can pay for the multi-member LLC. <coughs> Remember I said a little bit ago that some things open up? That home office deduction can be a huge factor in paying for most, if not all, of your extra LLC expenses, the refund that you get from that. Also, uh, another thing is when you do a personal return, if you're trading on your personal return and you have somebody do your return, uh, the cost for doing that return cannot be deducted because it's got a personal component as well as your trading component. However, this is going to be a separate tax return related to the business. And so that tax return is completely and totally deductible on this tax return. So that helps as well. So let's talk about how you can get the government to pay for your LLC. Well, if you've already got trading expenses, uh, and like data feeds and margin expenses, stuff like that, the refund you get from those expenses could pay for your LLC fee as well as your tax prep fee. Now, let's go ahead and take an example and I'll show you what happens. Assume a person lives in Indiana. Now, every state's different. So um, this is just an example and your state might be a little bit different. Your tax bracket might be different, but the LLC fee in Indiana is $50 per year. You got to pay that or else they will shut down, partially shut down your LLC. And let's just assume the tax preparation fee is $700 a year. So you have $750 in extra fees that you're going to have to pay for the LLC. Now also assume the person is in the 32% federal tax bracket and Indiana has a flat tax of 3.23%. So a total of 35.23% in taxes. Here's what, it, and based on this calculation, I can do this calculation for anybody depending upon what state they live in, irregardless of what state they live in. But this person needs $1,379 in trading expenses to get the government to give them a refund back to pay for those LLC expenses. Remember what I said about the home office deduction? You get, usually it's $1,200 at least in deduction and usually more. That pays for your LLC right there, most of it. Now, let me prove this to you. I'll show you how. Here's our proof. So remember, our trader has $750 in, in LLC expenses and a tax rate of 35.23. And we also calculated that they're, if they've got $1,379 in trading expenses, the refund is going to pay for the LLC. So here's how it works. Your total deductible expenses, you have the $750 that are the extra uh, expenses for the LLC, the tax prep fee, as well as uh, the the um, the licensing fee from the state, <clears throat> and then you've got the other thirteen hundred seventy nine dollars could be home office deduction, could be something else. But anyway, <clears throat> so you got a total of twenty one hundred and twenty nine dollars in expenses that you're deducting on the the the, uh, the LLC tax return. Well, if you multiply that by the tax rate of thirty five point two three percent, you get seven hundred fifty dollars in refund. Well, that is the extra expenses that you're paying. So in essence, you've got the government giving you a refund to pay for the $750 in extra expenses you've got for your LLC. So in most cases, the LLC, multi-member LLC will pay for itself. Uh, <clears throat> you just have to be willing to take the step and it reduces your audit risk considerably. Now, there are other entities out there, S corporations. Now keep in mind, S corporations, the officers or owners are required to pay themselves a salary. And so now you've got to worry about a payroll company. You've got to worry about filing uh, payroll tax returns, filing W-2s and all that stuff. And that may be the case that you want to go that direction because that's the only way you can set up a 401k or other retirement. 
However, we recommend the multi-member LLC first because you need time to establish your trading and you've got to have good solid income before you go to the S corporation. If you don't, because if you go to the S corporation straight up and you don't have that income, then you're going to be left for paying a lot of stuff that you can't use. For example, a 401k maintenance fee, and you can't put anything into it because you're not making any money. So we recommend start off as a partnership first, get things straight, get things going. And then it, when you get solid basis, then move into the S corp. Okay, so those are LLCs. That's an overview of LLCs and what we recommend. Uh, something to think about. Please do your research. Talk to other people. Find out what's going on. Um, be, I don't want you to rely on me. I want you to actually read and go to the IRS, read other things. And then if you want to sit down and talk to us, we'll be happy to sit down and talk to you. Now, our last major topic of today is the mark-to-market -mark election. Now, this is for stock and options traders only. Um, this is an election with the IRS. <clears throat> and so um, it does have to be filed with the IRS. You have to let them know you're going to do it. And any individual or business entity can make this uh, requirement if you meet the trader tax status qualifications. So this is why trader tax status and mark to market are related. You have to be able to meet trader tax status requirements before you get the mark to market election. If you fail to meet the trader tax status requirements, then you cannot get mark to market. Now, the other difference is trader tax status applies to any investor. So Forex investors can do trader tax status, but they can't do mark to market because it's not set up, mark to market's not set up for them. Um, <clears throat> so this is an election. Well, what this does, it basically changes how the gains and losses in your portfolio are calculated. And most of the time, you will pay less in taxes. Now, some of you may be familiar with wash sales. If you're trading as an individual, or you're just trading without mark to market, you're trading under normal, what I call cash basis accounting. And wash sales can occur. Now, if you're not familiar with wash sales, those are deferred losses. Basically, in a nutshell, is if you if you sell something and lose money on it and buy it back, anything within that ticker symbol within 30 days, that loss on the first transaction moves to the second one. Well, that doesn't sound like much, but if you're doing this over and over again, these losses just keep moving back in time and eventually they cross over that December 31st time barrier. And what happens is those losses move into next year and you end up paying taxes this year on stuff that you actually lost money in. And I've seen it time after time. Some of you have probably read the horror stories out there and some of them do exist because I've had to work with people on this. Mark to market eliminates the wash sales. Do not have to worry about them at all. Now it does it differently because it doesn't look at individual transactions anymore. Uh, it doesn't matter what you bought and sold anymore. It just basically looks at your beginning value of your account and the ending value of your account. And simply put, if you, your account goes up, that's what you pay tax on. If your account goes down, that's what you get to deduct. Uh, now, we have to account for contributions and distributions and stuff like that. But the concept is really simple. You're going to pay tax on what you actually earn or deduct what you actually lost. So there's no wash sale stuff going on anymore, which will save a whole lot of money and it's more accurate for paying taxes. Secondly, this election eliminates the $3,000 loss limitation. Under normal circumstances, without the mark-to-market election, if you lose $20,000 in your account, you can only write off $3,000 on your tax return, and you have to carry the remaining $17,000 forward. This is a net loss after all the gains and losses have been added together. So you have to carry the rest over. You only get $3,000 a year. Under mark-to-market, if you lose $20,000, you get to write the whole thing off in one year. <clears throat> um, and I've, I've done tax returns where I've written over $200,000 off in a year. 
So uh, it can be quite beneficial if you if you have a bad year, you just write the whole thing off. It goes against W-2 income, 1099 R income, whatever it is. And if you have more loss than you have income, then the rest of it goes to next year. And you can just kind of use it up as it goes along. Now, this, as I mentioned, is an election. It has to be made with the IRS at the beginning of a year. So individuals uh, had to have made the election by April 15th of this year. Well, April 18th, since they moved the tax gate. <clears throat> so it is too late to do mark to market for an individual. Uh, for existing S corporations or LLCs or C corporations, they would have had to have, well, not C corporations, they would have had to have done it by March 15th. So it's too late for everybody, existing people and entities to do it. However, there is one exception. Brand new entities. So for example, if you were to start an LLC, a multi-member LLC, by the end of this month, you can elect mark to market right away. Um, <clears throat> what would happen is, let's say you set up a multi-member LLC. It starts on, let's say, just say June 1st, just for an example. So June 1st, you get your trading account set up under the LLC. You start trading there. You can go ahead and tell your broker that you're trading under mark to market. Now, it doesn't go backwards. You can't do anything done under your social security number. But at that point, you can forward elect mark to market. And then when you file the first tax return, which would be March 15th of next year, you put the election with that tax return or with the extension, whichever comes first. But it does have to be done by March 15th. So if you're looking, if this is one way to actually get under mark to market still this year. So we're, we're here in May, and you may have incurred wash sales. Um, but if you set up a, an LLC and move your trading assets into the LLC, you can go under mark to market right away. And if you if you let your personal account go dormant and you don't do anything in it anymore, after 30 days, those wash sales become regular losses. And so you get the best of both worlds. You get everything this year under mark to market by forming an LLC and your personal account goes dormant and the, your wash sales become regular washes or regular losses. And so you really get both of those things. So the marked market election is basically changes how the revenue is structured and how accounted for. Uh, in <clears throat> most cases, you will save money by doing this. Either you will have less profit because you don't have to worry about those wash sales increasing your profit uh, un unduly, or you'll have a bigger loss, again, because the wash sales aren't going to decrease the loss because of deferment. So it, it helps, it almost always helps uh, stock and options traders. So in summary, <clears throat> um, trader tax status allows you to deduct trading expenses if you qualify. So you have to have 720 trades a year, you gotta trade 75% of the trading days, and you've got to have 500 hours in trading research and education. Forming an LLC, a multi-member LLC, is what we recommend, provides asset protection, decreased audit scrutiny, and it could be free because of the refunds. And another benefit, and some people argue with this, because, but it's a gray area. This is my personal opinion. You don't have to meet the trader tax status requirements quite as much. Um, it does give you some flexibility there as well. And finally, the mark to market election allows stocks and options traders to pay track tax on what you actually earned or write off what you actually lost. None of this loss deferral is actually what you did that matters. So <clears throat> here's our contact information again. Um, again, I put that link into the chat area so that you guys can have that. Um, and then our phone number is 800-938-9513. What we provide as far as uh, services, one, we do consulting. So if you want to call us up and you need a consulting session, and more than likely, I will be the one that does the consulting, we'll sit down and figure out what your needs are and how to make things happen. Uh, <clears throat> certainly give us a call. We also have a bookkeeping service if you want somebody to keep track of your books for the LLC. We can do that as well. The advantage of that 
there's twofold advantage. One, it keeps everything clean throughout the year so that when we get to the end of the year, we can take the financial statement, just put it right on the tax return. There's no scrambling around for information or anything like that. Second of all, it's of the general, we're of the general opinion, and I think this is true, that if you have a bookkeeper, uh, as well as an accountant doing your books, as well as your tax return, it's much less auditable. The IRS is going to look at it because they're those two are independent and they were going, they're licensed, they're going to do things the way they're supposed to be done. And so the, uh, the IRS is less likely to bother you in that case. And also our email um, at learn at tradersaccounting.com. Uh, so you can contact us there. So um, <clears throat> if you want to go ahead and put questions in the chat, then we can go ahead and do that. And I can answer uh, questions for a, a little while. Um, Let's see, has the IRS defined what a trade is? For example, vertical option spread could be considered two trades and then 10 contracts could be considered 20 trades. This is a gray area, unfortunately, Dawn. Um, now, <clears throat> generally what was speaking an IRS auditor and quite frankly, the IRS is not skilled at auditing this stuff. So, um, <clears throat> what we would do is we would look at your, the IRS auditor would look at your monthly statements. And if it's listed there uh, two times, then it would count as two trades. If it's listed 20 times, then it would count as 20 trades. Um, that's how they would do it. They're going to keep it very simple. Um, relying on case law doesn't seem safe to me since publication 550, it's vague. It's probably vague. So, uh, well, yes, but that's kind of backwards. Publication 550 is vague, you're right. And I think uh, they write this stuff very vaguely so that they can do the gotcha on taxpayers. But there are taxpayers who don't accept the gotcha and then go to court. And then the court rules in their favor. And that's where we are getting this, this case law, where the court has ruled in their favor, saying they do have uh, trader tax status because of they did put this in, whether it was 720 trades or the 75% of the trading days. So the court cases actually uh, overrule the actual IRS uh, publications and, and code. So it's much more solid actually than, than relying on that. So that's why we go to the court cases. Now, I'm not gonna lie because there's a lot of gray areas here. And so it uh, depends on how risk averse you are as to where you want to go with it. Uh, next one, I own an S Corp which buys and sells computer equipment. I want to move tra to trading full time. Can I deduct expenses while I am leaning and ramping up to this change? Um, we chose to be taxed like a LLC 12 years to business. Okay. Um, it is legally, it's possible. You technically in an LLC or an S Corp, uh, you can put multiple revenue streams in there. And that's fine. My only concern is, and I'll tell you this as well, is about legal liability. You do not want to put your trading assets into a business where there's another revenue stream that could have some legal liability. And the prime case that I talk about with, with clients is rental real estate. If you put rental real estate and your trading assets into the same business, then you're looking for trouble because if a renter sues and wins, they not only have access to your property, now they got access to all your trading assets. So you want to keep your trading assets really as separate as possible. Um, uh, keep them by themselves unless you've got another revenue stream that is really uh, liability free, that you know you're not going to get sued in it. And then I don't have a problem putting the two together. But it's that legal liability that can create all kinds of problems. Um, how about somebody who is new into just the futures market? Tax on those earnings. Um, futures, you can still do the trader tax status thing and write off your expenses. Futures investors cannot do mark to market because there is a special tax uh, 
tax structure for futures. And what's really cool about futures is no matter how long you hold the contract for, um, futures get broken out into 60% long term and 40% short term. So let's say you make 100 bucks uh, on a futures contract. $60 of that is a long term capital gain. And long term capital gains are capped at 20%. And more than likely, you will pay lower than that, usually 15% and possibly even 0%. So there is a very beneficial tax structure already with futures that you don't want to lose. Uh, I'm a trader's customer, can't speak highly enough to the staff. Well, thank you very much. Knowledgeable, accessible, and always ready to answer questions. Uh, so great. Nice to have you, Dawn, and uh, appreciate you saying those. Um, I set up an entity to trade before, and my broker then deemed that I was a professional, so I needed to pay for quotes. And it was a ridiculous amount per month. So is there a way around this? Uh, yes. And I'll tell you, this. here's what some clients have told me. What they do is on the business side, you have to pay for quotes, but on the personal side, generally you get free quotes. So I have a lot of clients that keep their personal account active, not doing a whole lot, but they get the free real-time quotes and they don't use the quotes in the business, but they actually do the trading in the business. So you use the free real-time quotes in the personal account, and then you actually do the trading in the business account. And th that's usually helps work around some of those fees. I don't know that it's going to get uh, around most of it, but uh, it will do some of that. Um, last question we've got shown here are SPY options 6040. Yes, they are. Um, <clears throat> SPY is uh, treated like futures contracts. SPX is treated like a normal option. Uh, which would, would fall under mark to market. So you have to be careful about these ETFs and some of the things that options that you're, you're getting into because I've had clients get very surprised that they've been thought they were trading regular options and it ends up when their 1099B comes out, they've been trading uh, options that are treated like futures contracts. Now there's not a lot of them. Uh, SPY is one of them. Um, Oh, yes, I do have that backwards. I thought something wasn't right. SPX is 6040. My apologies. I had that backwards. And SPY is not. <clears throat> so SPX is one of them. Uh, there are like five or six of them that are traded. And SPX is by far the most heavily used of those, but they are treated like futures contracts. So I appreciate the correction there. Um, um, I, I get them backwards sometimes myself. Okay, any other questions before we call it a day here? And uh, everybody good? Okay, I'm going to turn it over. Is David still around? Uh, yeah, I'm here. All right. So yeah, sounds good. Well, I think 